I'm saying the name of this documentary should be It's For The Movie. Don't you think? We said that a thousand <laughs> it's times. For <laughs> it's For The Movie. It's Mike and Axel. I was doing, along with some friends, a like performance art thing where we would rent out a space in this place in uh, the city. So we were having meetings about this, and one of the people that we wanted to have for the first show was Ernie, because my friend Vinny knew him. Mike Hall, I, I, I met years ago when I was actually an undergrad. Um, he had moved to the St. Louis area from Wichita, Kansas. So he came to the next meeting and he brought Mike. Because Mike had just moved from Kansas and he was living with Ernie on North Avenue in Jersey City. Mm -hmm. So then Mike came to the meeting, but what happened is at that meeting we decided we weren't going to do any more shows. Because we just it wasn't really working out like the dynamic. But the thing was that I had just left my job. I was editor-in-chief of this magazine, and I had made a short film with my friend Aaron at his apartment like six months earlier. I met Mike, and I was like, Mike, so what do you do? You know, man, like, what's your art, dude? And then he was like, well, I make movies. I act, I write, direct, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I was like, all right, you know, like, let's, let's talk about, let's make a movie, man. I had that I hadn't grown up with it, but I had just come from it. You know, we had made we'd been making movies for five years straight in Kansas before I moved out. We started talking about movies in general, you know, and and he was talking about you know wanting to make a movie and this and that. And since I had this kind of fresh experience, even though I hadn't been directing, I had you know been involved in the producing somewhat, had seen more than I had done, but definitely like had some idea of how to make a movie on a very low budget. We just got out a piece of paper and it was me, you, and Lou. Mike said, I don't have a job. I don't have anything to do, let's make a movie. I said, I don't have a job. I don't have anything to do, let's make a movie. And what we were hoping is that through my brother, we could get a couple of cameras and shoot the movie. That day we wrote it all out and it's basically just an outline and the characters were like, Three leads, Jack, slick, on-the-move pot dealer, Aaron, eccentric, weird, paranoid, and armed pot grower, <laughs> Mike, fish-out-of-water kid just arrived in the big city looking to score dope to smoke. Mike went, at, Mike went home and wrote the movie in like seven days or something like that. <laughs> we, were, we were sharing an apartment in Jersey City, and I remember we had no furniture at all. We were sleeping on the floor in the living room. The only thing we had was this table on which he would put his laptop and he would write the script. So I remember a bunch of nights like being asleep and waking up at like three o'clock in the morning and there he was at the computer, you know, typing the script out. Because you were thinking of Fred right. and Ernie right away because at that meeting, we're also like, and Ernie's gonna be in it. I can't believe I came all the way to Brooklyn for this shit. Fucking do you want those stuff? You fucking guys. Right? Ain't that shit throwing shit and all kind of dudes throwing shoes? And as it started going, I started basing the Carlos character more and more on Fred, which I had kind of initially in my mind. The director came to me, filmmakers came to me and said, you know, it pretty much fixed your character, the character Carlos, and things that have happened within my lifetime, so it was a pretty easy character to play because of things that I went through through life. We had said, like, Ernie's got to do it, because we both knew Ernie, but then I had seen Ernie and Fred together. Bang, little Asian bro. Dude, I'm the better. The fetish for some Asian bros, man. I was in the fetish pussy, man. Nah. You should invite all the time to bring one of our friends. I did, nigga. You know what I'm saying? I'm going over there. Oh, yeah. Me and Ernie are actually family. We're actually family. We grew up together in Brooklyn, of course. So it was, it was pretty comfortable and he made it really... It was comfortable for me because we act all the time without camera, so it was really like easy for me to just be myself in front of them. And that was something that I knew I wanted to use, you know. And so initially, 
I'm writing the Carlos character with Fred in mind, but Axel still hadn't met him, you know, so I keep kind of telling him, like, you gotta meet this guy Fred. And he's like, no problem, but we gotta do auditions. You know, like, this is a lead character. We can't just kind of hand it over. And I'm like, cool, but you gotta meet this guy Fred. And you gotta see him together with Ernie, you know, and this and that. You're doing too much. Doing Ain't nothing gonna much. happen, man, I promise, man. But there's nothing I didn't understand about those two characters. I mean, or any of the characters in the film, for that matter. You, I knew intrinsically what drove them because I knew those guys. I knew lots of guys like them. Axel kept saying like, well, we need to have auditions and we need to cast the movie because that's what people do. And I kept kind of, no, we don't need to, we can just, we, come on, I know lots of, come on, we can, this guy, yeah. you know. Our friend Derek Barris, uh, who is a great, great novelist and DJ and, you know, he's All around man. good guy who's he helped us a lot. He had a play called, I think, Bong Hits. Bong Hits, and he knew this guy, Jesse. And Jesse helped us out by sending out a lot of emails, and we had auditions at that same place, Shara's, where mm -hmm. we had done. We rented a room there, we taped it, and we had like, we had like, fuck, I don't know, like there were like 50 people that showed up. It was up. a lot, a lot of more people, people than up. I think you, you know, know we were able. Expected early. The casting was really easy. I mean, I think we looked at the tape. We looked at everyone, and right away we were like, "That's that person. That's, that's the that one. person. Right. That's that person." We thought we were gonna bar we, we were gonna borrow cameras to make the movie, you know. And yes, the style that I would, you know, about like shooting with like natural lights and stuff may have come from like dogma stuff too. But it was also that like we we're gonna have to lug those things around. We weren't gonna have a car. We wouldn't even know if we we're not going to be able to set them up on a street so everything looked consistently not lit so you're not like outside and it looks like crap and then you go inside and wow this looks you know what i'm saying like they're on a set i hate that i want to do a lot of handheld i wanted to look like almost like documentary style but still with a little more style like a lot of bright colors like I would try to choose something like in the background that was bright or a front door like we just walk down the street and say let's get that front door that looks bright. It's also influenced a lot by mean streets. I think you know typical reservoir dogs um, as far as like the colors and the motion and the texture and I wanted to also kind of like be look not uh, I don't know how you, like an old 70s like hippie blanket. You know what I'm saying? Like very different weird colors that might not look like they belong together, but have like a vibrancy to them because the characters, like almost cartoonish in a sense, the backdrops. Overall, the biggest influence on the shoot, the shots and the angles and stuff was of course Stanley Cooper. Because everything is like triangulated and everyone's always shot against something in the background, you know? Um, I want, I, do, I want to have like a lot of long still shots like when they're walking into the warehouse and they're just walking, you know? A lot of walking. And I think now that I was just, I was just watching like Manhattan and some Woody Allen, I think that comes a lot also from the Woody Allen films. I guess those old 70s films like that look kind of gritty and look like they were shot on the street, you know? Like um, The French Connection and great, uh, like the taking of Pelham 123, like stuff that just looks like New York. You know, that was really important. But the whole thing was shot with a handle from like a 1950s Brownie eight millimeter camera that actually still fit on the bottom of the PD-150 because I was holding it too straight when I was shooting without that. And the Brownie gave it like this slight off like that. And the whole thing is shot full screen with a wide angle lens. So everything looks a little bit on the sides warped and the people are a little bit wider than they would be. So then you get that kind of thing. So like you're stoned. You know they got hip huggers for dudes now? You seen them shits? And Those low rider jeans for dudes? And action. Weed? We did, yeah. we did some rehearsal. I think we did more rehearsal on the final scene, really, than anything else. Yeah, we rehearsed with everyone, and then you had... We did a lot of, re we did a lot of rehearsals where me and Mike would sit there, and we'd talk with them, everyone. And then when it got toward, towards the end of when we were going to shoot the movie, 
we kind of went separate ways and you were working a lot with Fred mm -hmm. on the specific scenes of Fred and Ernie together mm -hmm. and getting improvising and stuff. Rehearsal was just a lot of reading and just a lot of trying to fit into the character, you know, because, you know, growing up and being, that was the character that I was a long time before shooting this film. So, you know, I, I was raised and now things are different. So it's kind of hard. So rehearsal was basically trying to flash back to where I was back then. I think that when you're doing a film like this, the filmmakers gen t generally tend to be a little bit more open as to your creative input. So you become, it's easier to be more of a creative collaborator rather than a kind of photographed object, you know what I mean? Where it's like, no, you just stand here and you deliver this line. It's like, well, if you kind of let me do my own thing, I'll make it more interesting. And you don't really have that fight when you have a smaller budget. So it was a great experience. Look at this shit there. Oh, fuck, Take man. that. Oh, shit. Oh, man. Get the that's fuck the, out of here now. This is how you pay me your and cops. The times. And the Wait, you put some pennies in here, man. That gave me no fucking pennies. Yo, one of them is a buffalo head, too, you oh, man, And I was, like, making shot lists and trying to think about where we're going to shoot and, like, right. you know, all that kind of stuff. I'm at Tompkins Square. We shot a lot of it at Greenwich Village in New York, um, in Tompkins Square Park. And um, so we had a lot of, uh, okay, let's get this shot, you know, quick, before the cops show up type thing, you know what I mean? Mike worked really hard. He made all these spreadsheets and like of locations and what props we need to bring. And that made it a lot easier. Like being, being that we had little money, couldn't keep people there a long time. That figured in a lot to how we plan things. Like, okay, let's bring this person in now so we don't have them sitting around for an hour waiting, you know, and like also so we don't have to pay for their dinner. And you know what I'm saying? Like, well, the idea was know, if you could have somebody for four hours or less, then yeah. you didn't have to feed yeah, them yeah, or, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, and well, they couldn't get that annoyed with you. Action. So we thought every time that we were going out to shoot, we were like, well, what happens if we can't use that location? And most of the times we had a B location. Like, okay, if we can't, if they kick us out of the bar, it gets too loud, they won't turn off this well, or whatever, that was... we'll go shoot it over here and we'll change it up some way, you know? I hadn't been here long enough to really know anybody or have access to any locations. So that was something that Axel was like, well, I got this, and I got that. Yeah. And really like stayed on top of, of figuring out all of our location options. Cause I was like, we could shoot at the park that's where I, we could shoot in my apartment, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, 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 Jesus Christ! Oh. We had four days to shoot the final scene in Aaron's apartment. Oh, and man. we had already shot a bunch of other stuff in the apartment, but none of it like back to back to back like that. So we had four days to shoot the final scene. And Ernie was leaving and on Ernie the airplane was... the morning after. I'm gonna feast you. I'm gonna feast you. And after our second day, I think it was, shooting in that apartment, we still had two days to go. We were shooting the night before, mm -hmm. and the landlord has had left alone his eight-year-old daughter in the apartment by herself right. without telling her that we were shooting a robbery scene upstairs. Oh, Jesus Christ! Oh! And we had specifically told him, look, we're, because we, we knew we had People kids. People are yelling and right? cursing. We're like, there's going to be yelling, cursing, stamping on the ground. Gun, fake guns going off and people falling to floors and screaming, you know, and stuff like that. She's in tears. She's calling the mom, the brother. She's calling all these family members. Somebody's robbing the guy upstairs. And they were freaked out about hearing people upstairs screaming and cursing and all of this kind of stuff. So. The landlord got really upset, and, and a day before we were able to finish the shoot, he cut us. Aaron's landlord, like, basically was like, you can't come, if I see you back in this apartment, I'm kicking him out. God damn, and that's enough of that cursing and shit, man. So then Aaron panics, calls up, uh, listen, man, you cannot shoot this movie, the movie's over. You can't come to here and shoot tomorrow night. This is <laughs> Meanwhile, it. we've shot serious, like 70% like, of the of film. The yeah. like, we you had know. to shoot. So we're sitting there, me, Mike, and Ernie, and I was just like this, look, I, I don't care. I'm going to talk to him. So I said, I came and said, look, I'm really sorry that your daughter was scared. You know, we, we apologize. But you have to understand, we have almost nothing in life. I was like applying to hit the guy, you know, I was like appealing to his nature as like a newly, like he had come to America like eight years ago from Egypt, worked his way up and he was finally, he was just like, 
You know what, Axel? Okay, you finish your movie, man. You have a dream. <laughs> this is your dream, man. So then I went back, and Mike and Ernie were sitting there, and I was like, that's it, man. We can't, we can't do it. The movie's over, guys. They were like, are you serious? I was like, nah, he's letting us shoot it. Action. Well, working with, with the film company was, was really comfortable because, you know, we were friends and they made it easy for me when, you know, shooting, the, you know, some directors, you know, let's face it, can be assholes. So, you know, they, for me, with working with them was more, you know, this is how you have to do it, this is how you have to do it. And being that it was such a long process, it was easy to get done. So it wasn't, it, I didn't even think about the time span, how long it took. It was just getting the job done and how easy they made it, you know, to be. Mike did the first cut and we were both dissatisfied and we're looking for that extra thing to add to it that um, Ernie got with this company and we all went to Sundance together and we made a cut of the movie that doesn't have the split screens that is like a shortened 20 minute version of Smokers. We sold them on remaking the movie in Los Angeles on 16, on, or Super 16, really like on the go or HD and trying to get some B name, C name actors in it and like remake the movie with them. Unfortunately, as Los Angeles is, it's a town of people that are very like limited on vision and can't see past what's exactly in front of them to what something could be. And then that fell apart. And then we were like, dude, we gotta finish this freaking movie. Pays me when you need something. I'll meet you down here. I'll hit you off. Thanks. Bruh. Oh, uh, look at him. Eminem got them all acting nuts. Because the, the reason I did the initial cut is because every day after we would get done shooting, he'd come home and watch everything we shot that day twice. So by the time we were done shooting it, I hadn't seen a frame that we had shot. I hadn't watched a thing. And he had seen it all twice or more. So by the time we were done shooting it, I was excited to look at it and get into yeah. it and start playing with it. But he needed a break. He needed to let that stuff sit for a minute so he could come back to it and be excited by it because he was so wrapped up yeah, in it at the right. time. And then after I had done the entire first cut, I needed a break because I had been staring at all this footage yeah. and I had walked it, watched it a hundred times. And so I needed to sit back for a minute and at the same time he's seeing this first cut and is inspired by, oh, that's why I did that and this kind of... So over that time, you know, there's, and including up to that first cut, there's ups and downs where certain days I'm working, you know, all day long and then Axel sits down at 10 o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock at night. And when I get up at eight o'clock, nine o'clock the next morning, he's been working on it all night long. So, but for the most part, we kind of wave back and forth where one of us will do a little more and the other one sets back. And it was like that throughout the whole process, you know, and we didn't really, I mean, there wasn't, you know, like he shot more and I acted more, but outside of that, there wasn't really, like I contributed more to this or he contributed more to that. There were just times when one of us was, you know, more or less. But I think the the, the post kind of went, a lot of the ways that the post-production went was one of us would have an idea or we would together talk through an idea. One person would kind of apply it. The other person would be inspired by that and go, oh, and then they start to yeah. add their version of kind of that same thing. You because, know? and that is the, uh, the fifth column film's motto, which is the best idea wins. And that got <laughs> us through a lot of disagreements or person this, or like you have your heart set on this scene being like this or something. And then we said from the beginning, look, we're gonna have disagreements, but the film in itself is a, it's, it's like you create something, it's an entity up, upon itself and it has its own motion and, and moves you in a certain way. And if you're in the flow of it and you're in that zone, the best idea wins. Whoever, whatever we, whoever said, if somebody walked by us on the street and said, you know, like. You gotta point it over that way. Yeah, like something, we would be like, hey, does that inspire you? Yeah, me too, let's do it. And there you was, know, like, you know, and just, it was. It was very organic. I there think, wasn't the very many it. times when it wasn't obvious what the best idea was. You know, more often than not, it didn't take a whole lot of conversa you know, conversation before it was like, wow, that does work. We should do that earlier in the movie. You know, and that kind of, and also having the kind of openness to be able to say, well, I'm not sure about it, but let's try it. 
And there was a lot in the editing process especially that was, I'm not sure, but let's try it. And then you try it and you're like, oh yeah! And it did, you know, it does end up working. Hey yo, ma, you know the way that I feel The way I hold you close, the way I see you talking and nail I realize you're the one for me, I'm the one for you And that's the reason why I did what I did, I'm loving you Axel initially had ideas for particular scenes that would be split screen And there's certain things that were shot specifically to be split screen Now the final scene was not, it was shot to be shown like Rashomon Right, where you see the robbery from the different perspectives. Right. That, that right? final scene was an homage to what started in Rashomon, Stanley Kubrick did in The Killing, mm -hmm. and then Tarantino did in Jackie Brown. So this was the fourth, you know, <laughs> homage to that ending. <laughs> Do not. <laughs> and then you got to the end, and when we did it that way initially, like the sequence thing was exciting, it was like you know a what half I mean? Hour there was, long. But it was a half it hour, was so right? Long. It was just too long, and it was too. It just it. The movie slowed down instead of sped up at that point, and so we started talking about how to kind of fix that problem. So there's four characters, and you have the whole scene from each character's point of view and like a follow shot of them. So we've got at least you know, two really good takes of each character's so we shot perspective. The final scene so we, or we shot the times. yeah, we shot the final scene over and over and over, you know. So we've got all this footage for it. And so that scene actually got cut with that kind of rotating, pushing split screen style, the way that we ended up doing the transitions. That scene the final scene was the first one to really be cut that way. <laughs> And then we started, we went back and was like, this is badass. Well, what so we happened should, was, you know. we went back and we added all these little intermissions with music. And since Will and Alop had done such awesome music, we wanted to use it all too. Mm -hmm. So we ended up doing a little transitions. And then we went back and looked at other scenes and we're like, let's split screen this fucking scene. Because I had so overshot this movie, okay? I mean, like, we did every scene with, like, and we only had one camera, so we do it again and again, and every time I'd move the camera. And so we had so much extra footage that we could split screen things. We had a technique behind how we were shooting it. Let's have a technique behind how we were editing it. So, like, there's, like, a full picture here. And I think that it worked out pretty cool. It's mm. very different, you know? Like, I have not... I still haven't seen a film that did that. Right. Like that used a split screen, but I still haven't seen it as much as we did. Maybe some, you know, I, I think it came out looking pretty cool. Uh, Will and Alop of Dialect um, come in and after we had finished the picture, we locked the picture with Jeff and everything, we gave them the movie. They sat in a room for like a day or two and scored the entire picture. It's all original music that they did for us for nothing. And it's all original it's they did like, to the film, too. Yeah, it's like they, they watched scored the movie. The film. Like a lot would watch it and get inspired and score the film. And we have to thank them so much because it really sets the tone for the whole movie. Like the fact that they did an original, complete score for the film is something that a lot of people have commented on and I think both of us were really happy with because it really sets the mood mm -hmm. for everything that happened and the music is so good you know like they really rock so and we it's so diverse and you know it's really the first cut great we job. did you know we we used and up to the point that they scored the film we scored it ourselves using their music stuff that they already had yeah, out. Yeah, that's true. Because you know, I, and a lot yeah. of that really worked. It stylistically, it still fit their band and that movie stylistically still fit. But then when they went away and wrote music for the movie, you know, I mean, that's it did what a score is supposed to do. Like it's so much more. And I feel, I felt, I think we both felt immediately, like the film was so much more effective with the music on it. The go upstairs do the same thing. If he asks who sent you, just say Julie sent you. That's the system? Yeah. Where I know it from. Man, it won't even go that far, man. Can I say I fucked it to you? <laughs> This was like three years after we, two years, three years after we shot it. Well, we it. shot it, we shot from November into December 2002, and we had the computer by February 2003. And we finished post-production in May of 2007. 
So you go through a lot was, of like, I mean that the initial cut, you know, was done like fairly quickly afterwards, you know. But like, I think the whole the movie as you see it now was pretty much cut by like 2005. By like 2005, and then we had right. Jeff do the sound and Laurie. But there's and then you there's a lot the, of there's a lot of over that time. There's a lot of ups and downs. It was short and sweet, so to say. You know, all the points were made, and I see why this was there and this was there, and they they you know they took their time. And it went, went well, it went really well at the end. One of the driving principles of Smokers is that you can watch it and just have a good time and watch it. Like there's a lot of other things we add in subtext. And, but so you're just watching something that's fun, that's fast, that's cool, that you get done watching, you're like, that was awesome. You know, like that was just a fun movie. And then so other things creep in later that you might have noticed this, that, or the other thing. But in general, you could get a bunch of friends, watch it, have a blast, and just, you know, enjoy the film. Because that was a lot of, we just would, wanted to make a fun movie that you just watch with people and have fun, you know. Mm -hmm.